You are listening to We Saw the Devil, an investigative and conversational true crime podcast that deep dives into fascinating criminal cases that are solved, unsolved, or ongoing. From America's Lori Vallow to Jeremy's Armin Mivas, we examine and discuss the world's most shocking cases. If you're enjoying the show, don't forget to follow us online. Check us out at WeSawTheDevil.com and we saw the Devil on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. And don't forget, you can become part of the show by backing us on Patreon. Hello, everyone. You are listening to We Saw the Devil. This is Robin, and as promised, I am here with a news update episode. Headlines that I find interesting and think that you might too. And we have some really interesting ones this week, uh, especially ones that are going to turn into trials, which, as you guys know, I'm a sucker for a good trial. Secondly, sincerest apologies that this episode is late. Had a little bit of a technical difficulty. I use a mixer and I've been doing a renovation and unfortunately damaged a piece of my mixer. So I had to place an order and wait for that piece to arrive. Uh, Hence the delay in this episode. So sincerest apologies, guys. We should be back on track now. Let's just go ahead and head right into it. But before we do that, let's just get our quick housekeeping out of the way. You're listening to We Saw the Devil. I'm your host, Robin. Uh, check out our website, we saw the From there, you can find us across all social media, Instagram, Facebook, Twitter, etc. Also, if you haven't and you're enjoying the podcast, please take 10 seconds out of your day to leave a five star review on whatever platform you're listening on iTunes, Stitcher, whatever. It means the absolute world to us. Now, before we actually get into the news update episode, I would like to talk about something really, really quickly. I was actually going to include this as a news update story because on its own it is, but I don't know about you guys, but I've just been feeling kind of meh over the last, say, two weeks or so. We all live on social media these days, right? We all live, even news articles on regular news sites. It still has a comment section. I don't know about you, but the last two weeks, it's kind of dampened my spirits a little bit with just how cruel people can be on the internet. For every funny meme and funny comment in one of my shitposting Facebook groups, there are seemingly 20, 30 more of people just being unnecessarily cruel. I'm sure that most of you have heard that Anne Heche died. I apologize, I think I snapped at actually one of you after posting an article uh, about it on our Facebook page. But I'm seeing or have seen especially the beginning of August, a lot of posts making fun of her, uh, really horrible memes showing her basically on fire and things like that. And it's just unnecessarily cruel. And so kind of disgusted with the human condition here a little bit right now. But it made me think of her book, Call Me Crazy. If you guys remember when she uh, wrote that book, released it in the uh, early 2000s, I think it was around 2001 or so. I remember it being tied around 9-11 and all of the headlines that came out of that. So I decided to kind of go down the rabbit hole and do a little research and whatnot, see what she's been up to, because it's just a really horrible, horrible way to go out. And all I'm seeing online from pretty much everyone, guys, is, well, I have no sympathy for her. She made the decision, whatever. She she made her bed, she's, she's lying in it, or she died in it. Uh, just really cruel, horrible statements that, that I can't even fathom making about someone. And I'm not here to be the morality police. I'm not here to chastise you or, you know, say you're being an asshole. (laughs) I'm not into celebrity culture. I don't follow really any of them. But I've never really seen people be this hostile and nasty over anyone before. I don't think I've actually ever witnessed it. And it's just kind of made me realize just that, wow, that, you know, the internet has been an amazing invention. But wow, it has really desensitized people to humanity and being basic, decent humans. You know, I think we've all had people in our family who have made horrible decisions, whether, you know, intoxicated or not, that they shouldn't have and maybe gotten horribly injured, if not killed themselves. Um, You know, me personally and my family, I had a cousin who was drunk and riding his four wheeler and ended up uh, slamming into a tree. And he was in a coma for about a week, but he ended up coming out of it and everything like he's so alive and well. But not a single person said, well, fuck him. He did it. He deserved it. I have no sympathy. His side of the family rallied around him, visited him in the hospital, and, you know, everyone wished them well. Everyone said, oh my God, I hope he, I hope he survives. I hope he gets better. Everyone was worried. And I just find the fact that we as a society just lack empathy so much to be so sick in such a problem. 
And I know that Anne Heche's family is not probably going to read these comments, but although she does leave behind two teenage sons, minors, who, you know, may, it's just left a really, really, really sick feeling in the pit of my stomach. Watching a lot of people, um, even some of our listeners I've seen, you know, saying these things, it's just I find it really disgusting. So because it was news, I also wanted to touch on her background and the accident as well. Uh, So again, most of you know that she was uh, taken off of life support on August 15th, about a week and a half ago. She was an organ donor, so she was in a coma. She was not expected to come out of it. She was brain dead. And so they basically kept her on life support long enough to uh, analyze and then harvest the organs that were in fact usable. What you may not know about Anne Heche is that she led one of the most horrendous, horrific, saddest, traumatic lives I think I've, I've heard of. Anne Heche was born in 1969. Her father was actually gay. He had many, many affairs with men, uh, but he also, in fact, was a pedophile. So he actually started raping Anne Heche when starting when she was about two years old, leading all the way up to his death from AIDS at, when she was 13. So for about 11 years, her father raped her weekly, uh, some weeks nightly. I mean, again, her father raped her almost every single day for 11 years. Uh, Again, he died from AIDS when she was 13 years old after he came out to his family, uh, including his wife, Anne's mother. So three years later, uh, Anne is now 16 years old. Her brother that she was very close to purposefully drove his car into a tree and committed suicide. It took many years for the family to actually realize that it and accept that it was suicide, but it was. The member of her family that she was closest to committed suicide. Later on in life, Anne Heche's sister, Susan, died of brain cancer. So out of her family, she had only one sister remaining who actually is closer with her mother. Now, her mother was actually a religious zealot. Of course, her cause du jour is anti-homosexuality. She hates gays, and she is very vocal about gay conversion therapy, whether it's through actual therapy or the church. And so when Anne was 16, 17, she came out to her family as bisexual. Her mother basically uh, pretty much more or less kicked her out, said, get out of the house, you're not welcome unless you you change your ways. And Anne ended up making it into Hollywood. Anne had some small roles and started working her way up in the chain, you know, the chain of Hollywood. And she actually kind of found mainstream success uh, in the mid-90s with uh, some action films and things like that. She started to get a lot of notoriety. Well, it turns out she met Ellen DeGeneres. And if a lot of you guys recall, especially if you're old like me, you remember the mid-90s when Ellen DeGeneres on her TV show, when she came out, it was a huge ordeal. The far right, you know, the church culture just constantly crusaded against it, tried to get her, you know, her off the air. Ellen was constantly in the news and whatnot. So it was a huge, huge deal when Anne Heche and Ellen DeGeneres became a couple publicly and walked on the red carpet together, like holding hands and stuff. That was back in 1997. So you guys can imagine back in 1997 how that was just so controversial. And you also have to remember that Anne Heche had lost her entire family, either through death or homophobia. So she had no one. So she and Ellen DeGeneres got together in 1997, and by all accounts, then this has been confirmed through multiple people, is Ellen was incredibly abusive. She controlled what she wore, what she ate, where she went, who she spoke to, uh, very, very, very controlling in pretty much every single way. Well, due to the controversy of this, obviously, as Anne had previously started making her way in Hollywood, that stopped. She was mostly blacklisted after that. You know, studios, logic being... A, we don't want someone controversial, um, and B, how many mainstream cinema goers would believe that this lesbian is in a you know romantic uh, relationship with a leading man? So Anne Heche could have been the leading ladies like we've seen with you know Jennifer Aniston and and other people like that, but instead her choice to date Ellen DeGeneres basically killed that dead in its tracks. Not only that, but because Ellen DeGeneres was so much more famous with her, people uh, publications like the New York Times. They called Anne Heche both a publicity hound and a career opportunist. The paparazzi back then, it was still very, very vile. And we'll kind of touch on a few ways society was different back then. But it was very, very, very disparaging and gross when discussing her sexuality. After Anne Heche and Ellen broke up around the year 2000, Anne Heche had a massive, massive mental breakdown. And this is where most people, especially the younger generations, but this is where most people remember her from. Anne Heche had a complete break from reality. And she actually went to someone's farm in California 
She was completely balls to the wall, high on ecstasy. And the homeowner called police. And they showed up and Anne Hache told them that she was God and that she was taking people to heaven in her spaceship. Now, that is what obviously made the news. People mocked her on all of the night shows. Like Jay Leno made horrific fun of her. Rosie O'Donnell made fun of her and her talk daytime television show. I mean, everyone was just piling on her and making horrible fun of her. Like, she was Baker acted because of that, because she was so far gone. She had a complete psychotic break. And the paparazzi was just hounding her morning, noon, and night. Not only that, I mean, not only was she basically called every name in the book dating Ellen DeGeneres to begin with, then she had the psychotic break and it was just more fuel to the fire. Also, her career was basically over at that point. I mean, Hollywood, for a very, 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 very long time, did not want to touch her with a 50-foot pole, and they didn't. I mean, that pretty much put her, any hope she had for a mainstream return, that killed it, killed it dead. So she actually ends up doing better, getting better. She had a couple run-ins with uh, drugs and alcohol and driving and whatnot. But in 2001, she released her book, Call Me Crazy. And she actually details a lot of, like, basically her life story, the, the childhood abuse, the trauma, everything that she's been through, and her mental illness. She goes into depth with her mental illness and, and the different issues that she has, which is incredibly brave. It's still brave today for someone to publicly say, hey, I'm struggling with my mental health. One of my favorite singers, actually, her name is Céla Sue. She's a French folk, almost kind of like R&B artist. Uh, she's from Belgium. She has been very close to a psychotic break recently, and she's been very, very, very public about it. She has an extreme, extreme issue with severe depression. People are being really nasty about it. And first of all, obviously, we need to erase the stigma surrounding mental illness in this country because it's incredibly sad. People should be able to talk about their mental health struggles. Mental health assistance should be way, way, way more freely available in this country. But Anne Heche was brave. She was brave by coming out in 2001 and publicly saying, call me crazy. Here's my book. Here's everything that I've been through. Here are the mental issues that I have. And what happened there? Jay Leno mocked her on his uh, television show and said, quote, to think that all we had to worry about just two weeks ago was that Anne Heche is crazy because 9-11 happened. After that, Anne Heche kind of retired into a little bit of uh, obscurity. She got married. She had children. She has done some small independent projects along the way. She does well, then relapses here and there. She's kind of like in and out of the news a little bit, but she generally cleans up and generally has some sort of independent project. We last heard from her in 2018 with the Me Too movement. She came out and said that she was fired from a huge film with Miramax uh, because she refused to give Harvey Weinstein oral sex. She refused to give him a blowjob. If you recall, Harvey Weinstein, currently in prison, piece of shit, hope he rots, has raped countless women, actresses, basically, ha you know, forcing himself upon them to keep their jobs or get jobs. In an interview with the Allegedly podcast, she said of this, quote, the fact is, I was fired from a job that I had been hired for in Miramax. The repercussions of standing up for yourself were as deep and targeted as some of the scars of the women who actually got more physically, unfortunately, involved. So Harvey Weinstein tried to rape her. She refused, and then she lost uh, probably one of her, as she calls it, biggest opportunities that she's had. She was actually dating actor Thomas Jane. Uh, if you guys know, I know him mostly from the movie Deep Blue Sea. He was also in The Punisher, Hung, Texas Rising, and a bunch of other things. So he's a very well, well-known actor. They were together for a couple years and actually had just recently broken up again. So on August 5th, Anne Heche went to a little wig, uh, salon, like wig shop outside of Los Angeles and bought a red wig. I believe it's called Glass Salon. The owner of the salon actually took video and a picture of her, and he claims that she was completely normal. I believe in his words, he said she wasn't uh, right. Uh, she wasn't speaking in cursive, meaning she wasn't speaking with any form of impairment. She seemed completely normal. He said she was wonderful, very polite, very nice, and she left with the red wig. He actually posted that picture on Instagram, and within two minutes, she crashed her car. Apparently, she was driving at probably around 90 miles an hour or so. Don't know exactly what happened, but she was driving down the road, lost control, and actually flew into a woman's home. Went right through it, actually, like 20 feet into the home. 
the woman who lived there, she was renting. Her name is Lynn Michelle. And Lynn Michelle literally was sitting in a chair and Anne Hache's Mini Cooper actually came to a stop two feet from where she her and her two dogs were sitting. Now, the car burst into flames and set this woman's house on fire. This woman lost almost everything that she held dear. All of her trinkets, uh, uh, keepsakes, and things like that. It took over 50 firefighters 65 minutes to actually extinguish the blaze. They took the homeowner, Lynn Michelle, uh, back into the home and helped her grab a couple, get out a couple things, as well as her tortoise. She had a pet tortoise, too. But the home was a complete loss. Anne Heche was awake initially after the accident, and they loaded her up into the stretcher. There's one picture of her from the crime scene that you can see, loaded her up and took her to the hospital. News broke that she was involved in this horrible crash and that she was in critical condition. Two days later, uh, news came from her representatives that it looks like she was going to make it. Outpouring from um, other actors and celebrities and you know, famous people overall started coming out on Instagram and Twitter, and people started leaving really super nasty comments. I have no sympathy for her. You know, how dare you uh, give her sympathy? G- you know, give sympathy to the homeowner that lost everything. People were absolutely being taken to task if they said one nice thing or well or, or gave well wishes to her out into the universe. They just got so much hate for saying, "Hope she's okay." This kind of like status update on Anne Hache went back and forth probably until about the 10th. And then it was announced that, no, she's brain dead. It was announced that she is deceased. But she wasn't deceased. She was actually brain dead. But everyone announced that she was deceased. Then it came out that, nope, she's just brain dead. And then it came out that she's an organ donor. She's brain dead, but we're keeping her alive. So the organs can be taken, tested, and so forth. Finally, she was taken off of life support on the 15th a week ago, and she is now completely gone. She leaves behind two teenage sons who now do not have a mother. As I said a moment ago, I'm not the morality police, guys, but I find it really, really sad when someone on a really, really, really public stage has such a traumatic, horrible, horrible life. I mean, trauma is part of the fabric of who you are. Trauma does influence who you are and different things that you have to go through and overcome. And I just find it pretty sickening that people are damn near celebrating this woman's death. I, For the life of me, I can't understand it. I know I have my hypocritical moments and I can say some pretty spicy things about people, but it's something that I am working on on a day-to-day basis. I am far from perfect. But what I will not be doing is celebrating someone's death, especially someone with that level of trauma, background, life history, who literally lost the fight to the demons that they've been fighting for 30 years. So can we all just be a little bit more empathetic? just to everything and anyone, not just random celebrities that we don't care about who pass away, but like each other, maybe that would be a great start. And I know asking for that on the internet is like screaming into a black void where no one gives a shit, but gonna say it anyway. Empathy is not a finite resource. There's plenty to go around, plenty to go around. All right. So I just had to get that off my chest because it has been bugging me for weeks now. Um, Moving on, let's talk about the OnlyFans model who killed her boyfriend. This is going to be a very interesting one in court. It's already becoming very, very polarizing on social media. And it's the case of 26-year-old Courtney Clinney, uh, who was known on OnlyFans apparently as Courtney Taylor. She was arrested in the fatal stabbing of her 27-year-old boyfriend, Christian Toby Obumselli. Now, admittedly, I don't really follow OnlyFans at all. Don't really have a use for it personally. I couldn't tell you the name of a single person on it. But apparently, uh, Courtney Taylor, as she was known, was pretty big. On her Instagram alone, she has 2 million followers. So I assume that's kind of a big deal. And I am all about sex work being real work and whatnot, guys, but I can only separate so many blonde-haired, blue-eyed white girls showing their tits in my head before their names just start blending together. Swear to God. So in any case, she was arrested in Hawaii while she was enrolled in rehab for substance abuse issues as well as PTSD. And here's the thing. Courtney Clinney has fully admitted to stabbing her boyfriend to death. That's not even in question. Here's supposedly what happened. Now, for starters, she and Christian, everyone calls him Toby. So from here on out in the episode, I'm going to refer to him as Toby. So for starters, she and Toby got together in November of 2020. They initially lived in Austin, Texas for a little over a year. And apparently, domestic violence was rife in their relationship from the very beginning. Neighbors in their original Austin apartment complex said that they could hear them constantly fighting, screaming, and throwing things at one another. In fact, it had been reported to management and they were on the verge of being evicted, like absolute verge. 
Courtney Clinney was actually arrested at that time because she threw a glass at Toby's head and it just barely, barely missed him. And neighbors actually reported her taking a like a huge, 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 huge eight foot painting of a lion and throwing it over the third floor balcony onto the ground in the courtyard. Their fights were loud, their fights were violent, and their fights were dramatic. So they ended up breaking up while they were living in Texas, and Courtney ended up moving to Miami into a luxury condo in January of this year. Toby ended up joining Courtney, moving in with her and their two dogs. And because this shit is a pattern, the domestic violence and the fighting continued. Neighbors in Miami constantly reported the fighting to the condo management team. And again, the management was actually getting ready to evict them there. On April 3rd of this year, a tenant in the complex called the building manager saying that they once again heard a disturbance coming from Courtney and Toby's apartment. The manager actually ended up calling 911. 11 minutes later, Courtney Clinney called 911 and asked for an ambulance saying that her boyfriend had been stabbed. Now on this 911 call, you uh, you can hear Toby in the background saying, I'm dying, I'm dying, I'm dying, I can't feel my arm. And Courtney just replies, I'm so sorry, baby, over and over again. So police arrived and Courtney was in a black bra and a dress and she was covered in blood head to toe. And you can actually see the picture of this. Someone snapped a picture of her in the back of a, it looks like an ambulance, the back of an ambulance, but she's just absolutely blonde hair covered in blood, forehead, face, chest, bra, like clothes, all of it covered in blood. Toby actually died after arriving at the hospital. Uh, Courtney did admit to stabbing him immediately, but did claim that it was in self-defense and that he had actually picked her up by her throat and slammed her into the wall. While at the police station, she actually threatened to kill herself and was Baker acted for 72 hours before being let go. She was not arrested. In fact, she was seen around Miami just days later at local bars, often accompanied by her father. So at this point, so many people knew what had happened that they would verbally thrash her until she left the bar. Like they would tell her to get the fuck out. You killed someone. You you killed your boyfriend. Like get out of here. And guys, this happened the first week of April. We're now in August. So we're talking five months later. So as part of the investigation, Miami-Dade County's chief medical examiner determined that Christian Obumselli, Toby, the cause of death was a stab to the chest with a knife, which punctured his subclavian artery. Two weeks ago, Courtney Clinney was arrested in Hawaii with that warrant issued by Miami-Dade County. As I stated, she was in that Hawaiian rehab center getting treatment for PTSD and substance abuse issues that she was trying to relate to that stabbing. So she appeared in court and she waived her right to an extradition hearing and agreed to return to Florida to face those second-degree murder charges. Now, Catherine Rundle, the Miami-Dade state attorney, released elevator footage last week of the couple from February 21st, just two months before the murder. In this video, they're seen getting onto the elevator on their floor, and Courtney Clinney just starts beating the ever-loving shit out of Toby, repeatedly. She just punches and punches and slaps, and like she's trying to pull his hair over and over again, and he just stands there trying to block the onslaught. It's actually incredibly, incredibly sad. He at no point tries to hit her back. He puts his arm up, tries to distance himself. You can see him laughing and trying to like calm her down and de-es- like in terms of like de-escalating, not laughing at her. Obviously, that's not proof that he wasn't violent towards her. And I'm not saying it is. I'm just stating a fact. Uh, not only that, but people interviewed uh, those close to them, including her closest friends, have said that they've never, ever, ever witnessed him be violent with her or even... Courtney herself admit that Christian had been violent with her before, but they had seen her constantly uh, hit him, uh, assault him herself. So that's also very interesting and not something that we are necessarily used to seeing in these types of cases. Courtney told investigators that she stabbed him in self-defense after he grabbed her by the throat and pushed her into the wall. She claimed that she grabbed the knife from the butcher block and then threw it 10 feet across the room at him. Like he picked her up by the throat. She ran. She grabbed the knife turned around, and then threw it at him, saying that he was about 10 feet away, with it just by chance hitting him. Now, here's the thing. That supposed wound resulted in a penetration wound of eight centimeters deep that was pointing slightly downwards. So that's bullshit. That had to have been from close contact. It was a deep wound, and it curved downward, which means that someone somehow, most likely, was stabbing him and you know, with a downward motion. Not only that, but she waited 13 minutes to call 911 after he was stabbed. 
first thing she did was she texted her mother, told her mother what happened, and her mother gave her the advice of, quote, make sure to call it self-defense and not say anything without an attorney. Great mom, right? I mean, not wrong, but you can see where it's going. So this past Thursday, defense attorney Frank Prieto called the release of the footage damning, saying that it was an attempt by the government to prejudice and taint potential jury members against the defendant and deprive her of a right to a fair trial. He also filed an emergency motion to preserve Toby's body for inspection so that they could look at it again. However, he has actually already been buried in Dallas, Texas. And Toby's family's attorney said, quote, it would be sacrilegious to go against the family's religion for the body to be exhumed at any time. Such an extraordinary remedy would further traumatize his loved ones. The judge has not yet issued a decision on this and should be shortly over the next couple weeks. So that is going to be incredibly interesting when that comes down. But it is a very, very, very interesting situation. Uh, It's polarized social media yet again, with some saying there's no way, others saying he had to have been abusive towards her, it probably was self-defense. And the trial for this is going to be very, very interesting. But look for that judge's ruling if they will be able to actually exhume his body to once again examine for forensic evidence. Moving on to an insane case out of California. And this is a really interesting one. I cannot wait for this to go to trial. This is the case of Emily Yu, uh, the doctor who tried to poison her husband, allegedly, I guess I should say, allegedly, even though there is video. So 53-year-old Dr. Jack Chin was becoming sicker by the day. And this went on for about a month. March and April, he was feeling horrible and getting worse, so he decided to go get a regular checkup, and he was actually diagnosed with stomach ulcers, gastritis, and inflammation of the esophagus. These diagnoses, you know, something is being ingested that's that's harming him, so he racked his brain and was like, hmm, yeah, the lemonade that my wife is making me kind of has a harsh chemical taste now. It kind of tastes weird. His wife is 45-year-old Yu Yu, uh, aka Emily Yu. And they've been married for 10 years, and it hasn't been great. It hasn't been good, which we'll get to that in a moment. But Emily is a well-respected and very well-known dermatologist in California, and she serves as a director of a medical group, and it's swallowed all of her time. Like, she's always busy. They're a very busy family with two doctors and two children. So, you know, Dr. Chen was like, oh, is it possible that my wife is putting something in my drink? Is this marriage that bad? So he actually ended up installing a secret nanny cam multiple of them, in fact, in their kitchen, just to see if something was happening. Finally, the day came where Emily went into the kitchen to make lemonade, and the nanny cam caught her, live, grabbing a big old jug of brand name Drano from underneath the sink, taking the cap off, and bringing it over to the counter. Now, Dr. Chen apparently drinks a lot of this particular lemonade drink and keeps it stored in a very large plastic bowl that's covered in saran wrap in the fridge. The video captures Emily getting that bowl, taking the saran wrap off, pouring the Drano in, resealing it, and then putting the Drano away back under the counter. So Jack Chen was obviously shocked and appalled. You know, wanting to know if this happens again, he actually kept the cameras up and recorded her doing it again on July 18th, as well as July 25th. Once, she actually brought the Drano out and poured it into a mug, like a coffee mug, that Jack had already been drinking out of and briefly sat on the kitchen table. He quite literally started drinking his lemonade, put it on the table, and then left the room to see if she would mess with it in that instance. And she did. She literally brought the Drano out and put it in his drink, and he came right back to it. Clearly, he went to police and obtained an attorney. Emily Yu was finally arrested on August 4th. I don't know why people do what what it is that they do, um, but she actually called him to get bail money. She called him to ask if he would bail her out. First of all, sweetie, read the room. Clearly, he refused. He has been very, very public. Um, He and his attorney have been very, very public with their marriage and uh, basically with how things played out. He claims that there was physical, verbal, and emotional abuse, not only of himself, but also of their young children. He's obviously seeking that divorce, but also full custody, as well as a domestic violence restraining order. He made the statement while filing that saying, My children and I suffered from abuse by Emily and her mother, Amy. Because of the abuse and our inability to communicate during our marriage, I would write emails to Emily to try to get her to calmly discuss issues in our marriage and raising the children. More often than not, my emails were complaints of her abuse of the children or of me from earlier that day or just from the day before. In one email, he wrote to her that he had learned via her mother that their children had had a parent-teacher conference and no one told him about it beforehand. He'd wanted to go. He wrote, 
as usual, you're treating me like a house servant, not our kid's father. Now, Dr. Emily did in fact post her $30,000 bail and is currently staying in an unknown location. And this past Friday, just two days ago, it came to light that Dr. Chen had actually installed an interior home security system in 2013. Uh, It had a couple little cameras because he wanted to monitor their nanny. But Dr. Yu, his wife, Emily, actually cut the wires to that camera. He actually stated in a press release, quote, We set up cameras with microphones throughout the home, including the living room and children's rooms where the feeds sent to our computer in the master bedroom. Emily knew about the cameras because she would ask me to show her the video of who the nanny was talking to at certain times or something that happened with the children that day. Around January of 2021, Emily went around the house and cut all of the wires to the cameras, making them useless. I am currently reviewing the videos that were saved to see which ones captured Emily's and Amy's treatment of the kids and me. So it sounds like some really shysty sus stuff uh, had been happening for a couple years in that household. But that was quite the revelation on Friday. I wonder if he's going to discover more things that she's been doing to him and or the children. The Orange County District Attorney's Office has said that they are currently reviewing evidence to, to figure out which charges, if any, can be proven beyond a reasonable doubt. So she has not even been charged with anything as of yet. She was arrested. She's been re- paid bail. It's been released. She's currently, you know, restraining order. Husband's filing for divorce, taking the kids. And she has clearly obviously lost her job. But this is going to be very, very, very interesting if and when they file charges. Guys, I can't, I can't imagine that they won't. I mean, there's video. If you Google this right now, you can see video of her poisoning. him. <laughs> it's not, there are going to be charges, probably just a matter of time. Um, maybe they're even processing the, the video from 2021 or 2013 and 2013 as well. But just absolutely bad shit. Absolutely insane. And my favorite part of this is that when asked for commentary on this, Dr. Emily said, I wasn't poisoning my husband. I was just cleaning. Like what? Cleaning out his insides, cleaning out his soul. (laughs) Like what were you trying to do? Because it's pretty damn clear you were trying to kill him with Drano. So far, it's still allegedly. And we will see how this plays out. But it's so sad when someone so respected in their community, a doctor nonetheless, this is what she resorted to apparently. All right. Next up on the docket is if you're tired of hearing about it, I'm sorry, but not sorry. Uh, The Emmett Till case, guys. If you listen to my Emmett Till episode, you know that last month, a 70-year-old arrest warrant from the 1950s was found in the basement of a courthouse in Mississippi. The person that it was attached to was Carolyn Bryant, Emmett Till's original accuser, who is now 88 years old. Remember, she told everyone in her local town that a 12-year-old Emmett whistled at her and tried to grab her hand. It, of course, led to his horrific torture, lynching, and murder at the hands of her husband and his half-brother. Well, two weeks ago, a grand jury finally heard seven hours of testimony from investigators and witnesses, and still they came to the conclusion that there was insufficient evidence to charge Carolyn with kidnapping and manslaughter, despite the fact that she has admitted to lying even directly to police. Emmett Till's cousin, Wheeler Parker, is the only actual witness that is still alive today, and he was there and he testified. He witnessed Carolyn Bryant's husband, Roy Bryant, and his half-brother, J.W. Milam, abduct Emmett from his bed. After the grand jury's decision two weeks ago, uh, Wheeler Parker made a statement saying, quote, The prosecutor tried his best, and we appreciate his efforts, but he alone cannot undo hundreds of years of anti-Black systems that guaranteed those who killed Emmett Till would go unpunished to this day. The fact remains that the people who abducted, tortured, and murdered Emmett Till did so in plain sight in our American justice system was and continues to be set up in such a way that they could not be brought to justice for their heinous crimes. And honestly, he's right. I know a lot of you listeners are mothers. Imagine for a moment that someone plucks your child out of their bed in the middle of the night and inflicts every horrible type of torture imaginable on them, then shoots them in the head and dumps their naked body into a river. The reason? Another adult said that your child whistled and tried to grab their hand even though it's done in broad daylight and the murderers boasted about it, and even did an interview in a national magazine saying they were proud of it, your child deserved it, and they would do it all over again. 70 years later, an arrest warrant is discovered for the original adult who accused your child. It was never served. It was hidden so that it wasn't served. That accuser is now 88 years old. Would you want justice? Or would you think, meh, she's old now. She should just die peacefully. Or would you want her charged? I know it's really easy sometimes for people to view historical events through a sort of fogged lens. You know, oh, it feels so long ago. And you may not be able to make an emotional connection to it. 
And that's why this case has bothered me so horribly and why I spent so much time on it. I'm in literal disbelief that we pride ourselves, being the United States, saying it's such a paragon of democracy, and then this happens in 2022. It's just so hard for me to grasp and even harder to grasp that no one seems to give a flying fuck about it. But I digress. It seems as though unless something just absolutely insane happens, the Emmett Till case is finally over and Carolyn Bryant is not going to be charged. But that's it for today, guys. Thank you so much for listening. Sincerely appreciate it. Back to regularly scheduled programming now. Thank you for your patience with this one, even though it's a tiny bit late. And I will be back Tuesday with another episode of the Killer Musicians series that I started. And that's for musicians, well-known people, artists who have committed heinous crimes that maybe they're being punished for, or maybe it's just been conveniently swept under the radar. But you may find some surprises in there. So again, guys, you've been listening to We Saw the Devil. I'm Robin. Don't forget to check out our website at wesawthedevil.com. From there, you can find us across all social media, as well as our Patreon. And if you've enjoyed this episode, the content, please take five seconds and leave a five-star review on the platform of your choice. Until next crime.